I just like don't wait around for anything or anyone to like create space for me. I think that's just it. Like I wasn't the artist in which people were like, Oh my God, we just want to like sign her right away. Like I've had to work real hard. I've had to um, just like create a vision for myself and constantly walk into spaces where there is no clear path as to how that's going to happen and just to absolutely trust that it's going to. And so a lot of it for me has been a lot of faith. Um, it's been staying ready so that I don't have to get ready so that when, you know, opportunities present themselves, I'm just ready to go. I'm also the person that if you give me a microphone and you put me in a space and you say go, I will show the hell up. And so... <laughs> Welcome back to a brand new episode of Inner Sleeve, the podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. I'm Cassius Morris, Joe Pacheco joining me on the line as always. What's up, Joe? Doing good, man. Doing good. Summer feeling, smelling the summer flowers and all that stuff. Uh, definitely puts, Summer 2022, uh, man. Yeah, so far it's looking good, man. It's looking promising, you know? It's feeling good for sure. And definitely want to let you guys know that if you want to get into the summer mood, the summer vibe, make sure to go check out the Sound Mojo merchandise page. Get yourself a t shirt, hoodie, maybe a new phone case for the summer. I know that we'll be getting them and uh, quite comfortable, if we may say so ourselves, right, Joe? And we do, and we do say so ourselves. We yeah, definitely no, do is. say it quite it a is bit. Comfortable. Yeah, yeah. We don't skimp out, uh, you know, like and go for the lowest kind of, uh, you know, quality kind of thing. Diving right into some music news, Johnny Depp is doing a victory lap around the UK, <laughs> not on his own, but with Jeff Beck and the Jeff Beck Band. Now, for anyone who missed this, of course you did not miss the trial with him and Amber Heard, but yeah. right after the trial at the very end, Johnny Depp flew over to the UK for a series of performances with the legend himself, Jeff Beck. He was uh, seen partying it up all over the UK in pubs, in restaurants, saying he's still in shock about the trial. And <laughs> now it looks like he's releasing an album with Jeff Beck, which is pretty insane. As a huge Jeff Beck fan, this is like, I'll actually give this a listen. Like, I mean, when I say actually, I'm not familiar with Johnny's music, like with the Hollywood vampires and all that stuff. Are you familiar with that? Very little. I'm more familiar with his collabs with Marilyn Manson. I've seen him on stage playing Sweet Dreams. They had a music video together, which was, you know, probably used in court as evidence. Uh, but that's about uh, as yeah. much as I knew. Yeah, and no, I was it was I was surprised too. And like uh, you know, at the final hearing uh, or the final verdict, he's not there. And I was like, where, where is this guy? He's turning it up with Jeff Beck of all people in the UK. You know, like crazy stuff. But uh, no, I'll actually give this a listen because I'm a huge Jeff Beck fan. And uh, you know, I think Johnny, it's like music was his first love, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Like he probably wanted to be a musician more than anything else. But I mean, the guy was the biggest actor on the planet for a little while there. Well, it's funny that if you actually look at his Instagram bio, which he still has up now, it says occasional thespian. So it's almost like <laughs> he's more so a rock star in my mind than he is an actual actor. Uh, but nonetheless, he's great at both. And the quote down below from Jeff Beck, he told the crowd, I met this guy five years ago and we've never stopped laughing since. We actually made an album. I don't know how it happened but it'll be out in July. <laughs> I love that quote. I mean, and that makes sense with Johnny Depp. I feel like a lot of things happen. You may not understand uh, how or why when he's around. Yeah. And like, you know, I don't personally as a, a fan of Johnny, but like, uh, you know, just, he looks like one of those guys that you could just, you know, you're just going to have a good time, chill, relax, uh, ha laugh all the time. And, you know, I, what my takeaway from that quote is that like, there was a hell of a lot of drinking and a lot more going on at the same time, but shit still got done. Right couple pints couple songs i guess that's how a lot of uh, great records have been made <laughs> yeah, yeah are you like looking interested like looking forward to this I'll check it out. I mean, Jeff Beck, I think, is is amazing for who he is and, and what he does. I think he, he's untouchable in the world of guitar. That being said, I'm, I haven't been clamoring for the new Jeff Beck. Um, but mm. now that Johnny Depp's involved, it's a little more interesting to me. Yeah, it's funny because like Jeff Beck, I got into him as a guitar player. I always heard about him, everybody raving about him, like other guitar players. But with like limited access to music as a kid, I didn't, you know, I couldn't get like the albums or whatever. So in, in the 90s, I ended up buying Blow by Blow and Wired. And those mm. are two albums. If anybody wants to get into like Jeff Beck as a guitar player, those are the ones to get into. Like that nice. will change you. And what's cool about Jeff Beck, when you compare him to other guitar players, which is not really comparable, you know, like, I mean, the guy's been a part of like some iconic stuff, but I mean, he keeps evolving in a way that other guitar players don't. He takes chances, yeah. 
he does like you know there was an album i really got into in the early 2000s where it was a little more more electronica drum mm-hmm. and bass with some stuff so like he experiments a bit more he I plays think, with to, it then to traditional let's say like eric clapton will like you yeah. know everyone knows him as slow hand but he's gonna stick to the blues rock acoustic kind of stuff you know whereas jeff beck will try some electronic some heavier stuff some bluesy stuff apparently he also takes a lot of time off in between that he doesn't play guitar really for like years you know wow. it works and he works on muscle cars right? he's like a muscle car guy mm. you know and then then he gets back into guitar and then it's like but he's still incredible you know so anyway he segments it in different parts of his life yeah yeah i'm, I'm just gushing because like i'm a huge beck fan and like uh but oh, he's yeah, a man I'm excited. I'm excited he's to a guitar this. player's I mean, like, guitar player he, there you go i was gonna say that but like i actually don't know how old he is you know but i mean this guy's still going man and he's still kicking ass Queen fans are in for a big surprise and treat at the end of this year. It looks like some files have been unearthed and the Queen camp are going to be releasing an unreleased track with the vocals of Freddie Mercury for the first time in decades. Now, I mean, Joe, speaking, you know, I think we're both huge Queen fans. This is a big deal. Yeah, this came out of left field, literally, man. Like, uh, just... I, I searched up music news and I saw Qu- Freddie with a new track with Queen. I'm like, oh, let's check this out for sure, you know. And uh, yeah, to be honest, like I remember his passing, you know, 1991. And, and like, again, I'm shocked that uh, 30 years later, it's already 30 years that it's passed. Uh, but it's, this is stuff that was found in from sessions that would date back to 1989. You know? It's unbelievable. And I mean, the quotes, you know, it was hidden in plain sight. I mean, it's it's crazy to think that you could be digging through files and something of such significance could sort of just be sitting well, there. Yeah. And I mean, like, it's Freddie, man. I'm excited to hear something new from Freddie, you know, like, and the guy was just a monster vocalist, right? Performer. I mean, now, like, what do you expect for it? Are you expecting hmm. the sort of ballad Freddie or are we expecting like sort of uh you know killer queen you know maybe mm. more show tune type i have no expectations to be honest <laughs> it's hard to tell yeah i'm just like whatever comes comes you know i'll take whatever uh you know but like i don't know it's a good it's a good point i didn't i, I also wasn't aware see because queen like i say this often you know but queen is like they've had three life life's lives sorry uh you know because of the success of um you know general success and then bohemian rhapsody blew up and then it blew up again in the early nineties with the Wayne's World, World again <laughs> with with the docu- uh, the, the, the the biopic. So it's like it never like their music is timeless. So it never feels like there's old music, right? So like I didn't know there was they hadn't released anything since nineteen ninety five. That, that wow. was surprising to read. That's insane. And I mean, of yeah. course, with Adam Lambert as well, and you know, touring and, and doing all that stuff. Now I'm I'm curious if any new music will ever be released with him also. That's a good question because, like, fantastic singer. I mean, like, he's great. I actually just saw him recently because Queen performed for the Queen's Jubilee, her 70th year on the throne. Oh. And I, and I saw, like, you know, Adam Lambert performing uh, with Queen, you know, and it was like, wow. You know, like, I would go see that. I honestly would go see that. I wouldn't uh, snob it out, you know, and say, no, no, it's not, uh, it's not Freddie. But I wonder, new music, would it, I wonder how well it would be ex- accepted. It's so hard to tell. I mean, uh, I, you know what would be cool, just spitballing here, would be what if they did something mixing the two? Like what yeah, if they found more tapes and then put them on it? Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. That would be awesome. Or like, yeah, or like an unreleased track or something and then yeah. have both singers on it. I, I would definitely check that out. Why not, right? Because at this point, I don't know. I mean, if you're a, you know, a classic Queen fan, you're like probably don't like the fact that it's uh, Adam Lambert. But I mean, I think generally like there's been two singers now in queen you know but yeah. like obviously on album there's one <laughs> so far but legacy wise there's two yeah now we just got news that alec john such has passed now this came from word from bon jovi on his social media and he actually put up a statement if i'm not mistaken yeah and he said like he, basically alec was there at the beginning he's the connecting piece that got everybody together right like so like he was already playing with the drummer then he got the guitar player and then he got the keyboardist so like he's the connector that the got glue. them uh, you know to the formation of the band you know and like with and like special memories for this guy like i mean he left in 94 he, he was replaced by hugh um oh, no, i forgot his name it's here uh Hugh McDonald, yes. Right. And um, so, like, yeah, it was already weird to see someone else in Bon Jovi, but, you know, like, and then, like, Richie left, or left, or was asked to leave. So it's kind of weird yeah. growing up with this band, seeing these guys as the founders, and then, like, seeing, like, 
they've continued on with other members, but I mean, I don't know why he left. I think maybe, I think he seems to be a little older than them because here it says 60 year old John yeah. and 70 year old. Um, so like maybe, you know, like he's like one of those, the older guys, you know, the, the mentors and stuff. I mean, probably got tired. I don't know. He seemed to be like a pretty like busy guy, like uh, doing m- many aspects of the industry at the same time. I'm sure he had his hand in different things behind the scenes. And I mean, it, it, it's interesting to think about that. The older guy in the band, you know, how they, they would be the glue. You know, they would probably have a little bit more life experience, obviously, but more foresight into, you know, what to expect or, you know, problem solving skills. So I could totally see him maybe being a, a driving force and keeping those guys together. And also, you know, some legendary bass lines. I mean, when you really think about it, they're not overly complex. They're not difficult, but you know definitely holding those songs together very cohesively well you know like living on a prayer right everybody knows that doom, 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 doom. That's, that's it kind of like you know that's the groove man that's, that's big what stuff needed. and what i love about you know like he's not like a shredder bass player he's not like a super technical guy he plays for the song you know and that's what you need you need exactly. people who play for the song like tico torres is not like the greatest drummer on the planet but hey man he's been there for 30 something years and like uh you know doing his job perfectly so Anyways, it's always sad. You know, we always want to yeah. mention like uh, when uh, someone, you know, founding members or like someone of like, you know, that had a, like Bon Jovi, in my opinion, sort of defined, was part of the definition of that generation of those bands, right? Absolutely. Like, if, you know, so it's like, yeah, I figure we should uh, definitely spotlight it. And it's always sad. So condolences to the family and everyone and the band and everyone who's affected. Hopping over to our Sound Mojo YouTube channel, which we hope you're subscribed to. Hit the little button down below if you're not yet. But we put regular comms tabs up here every single week to see what you guys want to see and hear on the show. But more than that, what you guys are enjoying in the world of music, past and present. And here's one that we put up a couple days ago, asking you to vote on the best Nirvana album. Now, before we reveal the results, Joe, which one do you vote out of this combo? Because as you can see here, we also have the Unplugged record, which is technically a live record, but I think it still counts. Yeah, uh, well, I like, I, I'm partial to the Unplugged because at the time I was always into, like, everybody was putting out those MTV Unplugged albums and stuff, so it was fun. But I mean, never mind. It's like the definitive you know, album, for right? Me, it's hard to avoid. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there you go. We had 63%. So I'm like uh, right online with the, the majority of the people. So thank you for voting again. And uh, it's good to know. So maybe we'll do some, it will I'm guaranteed there's got to be a nevermind anniversary coming up soon. So we should definitely, definitely. tackle something on that, uh, which I'm perplexed where it says other, because there's no other Nirvana album. I'm oh. just realizing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. B sides, rarities, bootleg, yeah. somebody might Demo have an tapes, awesome you're bootleg. Right. So, so, you're so right. yeah, Lorenzo, I hope I'm Pignanoli. I hope I'm saying that right. Basically smells like teen spirit, lithium, enough said. There you can't go. argue with that <laughs> can't argue with that and in case you, like I was mentioning uh, anniversary albums in case you missed it we had the last week's episode with uh, 40th anniversary of Number of the Beast which we could and probably did talk for hours about and I had to chop That's it right. all down <laughs> but yeah that was a fun experience man uh, you know, awesome a times of, uh, with Carlo from Fane yeah 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 that's it so here's another one here so will you listen to Travis Scott's new album Utopia what do you? What would you? Uh, what's your uh, answer? Uh, see, it's hard for me because I'm still struggling with listening to his music after the whole tragedy. But it's going to be hard not to listen to one of the most anticipated releases of the year. So I'm going to have to say yes. So you're saying yes? I say, I'm oh, going to say I, yes. I, I'd probably say no. I'm pretty okay. sure I will. there's just not enough hours in a day, so I'll say no. That makes sense. And Damn! Holy a resounding moly. no. <laughs> resounding no. So I'm wondering if it's just people who don't like him already or if it's um you know like just due to the whole astral world and all that craziness that went down you know well i think it's a healthy mixture of both you know they, they did a poll uh, i'm not exactly sure where this was done but you know they they asked about the most hated celebrities and travis scott ranked higher than most politicians and and you know being <laughs> worldwide hated so wow. i mean it, it was yeah it was it was pretty he was even higher than trump i think on that poll so, I mean, it was insane, but when you think about it, it was one of the worst PR stories in the past decade. The other thing, too, is that Travis has not been able to land a booking since the issue. He was kicked out of, out of Coachella. He was kicked off many festivals. And just today, as we're recording this, he's landed his first festival booking 
since the Astro World tragedy. So, Joe, I mean, do you think this could maybe work in his favor if he comes back and has a really great show? Or, or do you think it's just not the time for Travis to come back? I don't know. I think uh, time uh, and everything, you know, like, I mean, there's those families and stuff are still hurting and stuff of the people that were lost and stuff. But I think, like, I think he'll come back. Now, whether it's to massive acceptance like it was before, I don't know. But, I mean... I think he'll be back. Now, this one was interesting for me, Joe. We asked everyone following the channel, do you make music full time? And we got over 100 votes. Now, I want to say a lot of people said yes, but I can't imagine it's most people because that that, that would be, you know, quite something. Well, it's funny because like I, I consider that I make music full time in the sense that, you know, I work on musical content and like and stuff like that. So... I don't necessarily do music full time anymore. I used to work at studios. I used to work in radio, all that stuff. I guess at this point, I don't know if I should answer yes or no to this because I don't know if I'm doing, am I doing it full time? I guess so. It's music related. So, but I don't make music. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of like in the middle. <laughs> oh, wow. That okay. makes sense though. Yeah, I figured like it's a lot more music listeners and lovers. Uh, that, that, but we have eighty six percent out of one hundred and thirty three votes. We have eighty six percent that said no, they don't make music full time. We do have a couple of comments, so let's go check those out. Tough crowd, <laughs> tough crowd. Because yeah, there was no comments for a long time, and like it was like resoundingly no for the longest time. So even here, I put yep. That's why I count myself lucky. Even though I answered no here, but I still consider like I'm working on musical content and stuff. So. So anyways, we appreciate everyone who voted, participated, like uh, this is what gives us, you see, this will make us think of like, okay, do we make more like tutorial kind of stuff? Do we make, exactly. do we talk about software or even in inner sleeve when we ask like the artists, I'll always ask studio questions, productions. So maybe it's not as necessary anymore. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know. You let us know in the comments. Let us know in the comments and yeah, make sure and to hit that subscribe as well. Today's guest on the interview portion of Inner Sleeve is Toronto-based artist Dominique Grant. She is a phenomenal singer-songwriter who's celebrating the release of her brand new EP, Queen Dom Chapter One Queen. She's also a producer for various different projects, including partnerships with RBC. She's been featured on CBC Q Radio and worked with producers such as Jarrell the Young, who's worked with Drake and is Grammy nominated. Now, there was a lot to... Now, we had a lot to talk about in this episode of Inner Sleeve, and we definitely hope you guys enjoy it. And if you do, please hit that like button and leave us a comment letting us know your favorite part of our chat. We're going to dive into our conversation with Dominique Grant, and we'll meet you guys right afterwards. Can you love We're back with another awesome guest right here on Inner Sleeve. It's a pleasure to be joined by Dominique Grant. Dominique, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Going really, really good. We appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, all the way from the UK today, which is which is pretty cool. I know you've been busy. Maybe maybe tell us what's been going on over there. Yeah, um, I'm just here for uh, some some private events and meetings. So we're doing um, some industry listening parties for the new EP and. Um, and some other stuff that I'm not able to talk about yet, but <laughs> really good stuff out of here. That's awesome. Would you say that most of your time, because I know you do so many different things, you're involved in video production, directing, would you say it's mostly with music or is it mostly like an even mix of different things you're doing? That's a great question. So I, I feel like there was once upon a time um, where as an artist, we could just be like, oh, I want to focus on music. And then we had all the other things that we did. but. Um, I feel like even if I wanted to only focus on music, it's like with in between TikTok on its own, it's just like you kind of have to do that. So I think that like 50% of my time is spent on music and 50% is kind of spent on the creative. And I have a really amazing team behind me that kind of helps me execute everything. But I definitely say it's a 50-50 split right now. Very cool. So, so, I mean, would you say that that other part of it, the TikTok and the social, does that feel like more of work or does it just feel like just as enjoyable and is just part of sort of the, the whole package? I definitely enjoy it. I have, first off, like big shout out to my TikTok fans. I have some incredible TikTok fans that really make creating worthwhile. Um, you know, you do get into the space where you're like, okay, you have to 
come up with this much content on a weekly basis in order to kind of be seen and to be visible. Um, so I'd say it's a combination. On one side, social media like makes me a little anxious. <laughs> so yeah. I have to kind of like I feel like it, I have to push through that a, a lot in order to show up. And and then on the other side, once I get into the flow of it, it's really good. But I I'm not naturally someone who just is like I want to be on socials every day it, it makes like I have to meditate and get into a space of really feeling comfortable so right how do you come up with like uh, the content do you like plan it in advance for like TikTok and stuff yeah um <clears throat> I think it's a combination so I am a theater kid I always say this so I spent like half of my life in theaters just being really weird and learning how to channel creative ideas into something useful which is why my mom put me in music um, and theater. So I'd say that it's like a combination. Uh, I'll be walking down the street and I'll just come up with ideas and pull up my phone and shoot it. But I do have particular days of the week where I do focus spe uh, specifically on pumping out content and on creating content and getting it to my team so they can help with editing it. So Nice. So, I mean, for the theater stuff, when you first joined, was that more so for the acting or, or was it more so for the singing element of it? It was more so because I was strange as a child. <laughs> my mother was like, you need an outlet and whatever you're doing right now, isn't it? Um, so it was, we, we didn't really know. But um, I think that I got into theater in a slightly different way in which there were a lot of prominent spaces in Canada that just needed people to create stories. And so I went in just with this idea that I was working with artists to just like create these performances where we co-write the scripts and just come up with a show, but they usually didn't have anyone to write music. And so I kind of actually got into songwriting through writing music for, you know, Dora nominated shows that were touring. I didn't know that that would kind of be a really incredible, like, opening for me to learn a different way of songwriting but I started out I'd, I'd say with with writing and with music and then the acting kind of just fell in naturally because it was a part of it wow so it's all tied in and, and I mean it seems like Ontario especially has so many opportunities for up-and-coming artists and just artists in general I mean maybe if you could talk about that and, and some of the other things that really helped you out yeah so I mean there are very few places in the world that give funding to artists. And I didn't know this until I started traveling and touring. And so Ontario has like a pretty, pretty extensive pool of funding for artists, um, whether it just be like traveling, development, recording. Um, if you have an idea, they're like, how can we support it? So uh, I would definitely say that I am very fortunate to have support from quite a few, you know, the arts councils and different companies and organizations that just believed in me from, you know, early on and were like, we want to support your vision. So I'd say on one side, um, there's just lots of grant funding here. And then on the other side, there's um, a lot of, you know, companies that want to support artists that are doing really well. So I know part of my journey has been with RBCX Music. Um, they're a major bank in Canada, but they also have a pretty incredible development program for artists. And um, I was selected amongst, I think, the hundreds of artists that they have in the program as an example to be a part of a Grammy spot. So um, last year, they were like, hey, do you want to appear during the Grammys? And I was like, hmm, let me think about that. Yeah, ah, nah, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm a little busy right now, but let's <laughs> talk about it later. Um, yeah, so they kind of created a, a set inspired by, you know, my music and then three other artists. And then we were featured in a national campaign or an international one and then a national social media campaign, which reached like, um, for me, over like 10 million people. So it's kind wow. of just been... Yeah, it's just been like a, a really organic thing in that funding in Canada isn't like the easiest to get. You do have to work really hard to get it. But um, I feel like every artist starts to enter a phase of their career where people are like, I want to support you. And I'm really grateful to have, you know, funding and, and then also to have brands that are like, we want to work with you and figure out what your vision is and help you and invest in you. So, wow, we're yeah. blessed over here. Yeah. How would you suggest an artist get started with funding, like which, what's the best avenue for them to go? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the first thing, because I get hit up all the time, people are like, you know, you went from an independent artist with no team to just like having your own a label, which I have now. Um, and I think the answer is just, you got to start with like understanding your value and understanding like what it is that you are offering. Um, I think that artists and a lot of people today, the first question that they ask is like, how can someone help me? But if you kind of change that and say, you know, what is my project going to do for these other spaces? If there's a funding application and it's like, they're giving away, you know, $10,000 instead of being like, Hey, I have this project, give me money. The question you mm. need to ask is 
what is this project going to do for the goals that you have for that funding? And if you can make sure that it aligns with that, you're no longer just asking for something. You're really looking to offer something in exchange. And I feel like as an artist too, that's just been like a principle that I learned from my mom. She's like a, a Jamaican woman that immigrated to Canada when, when she was nine. And she really taught me the the understanding of if you always go into every space with the idea of like, what can I give to other people before I ask it? It's literally been the the core of how I built my career is just always offering, always being grateful and always thinking about business as, as an exchange and not just taking, but in making sure that like the value in there's a value exchange. And, and so, yeah, no, hundred percent. Because like, I mean, it's like almost like a job application when you're looking for like, oh, okay. And then you read the application. You're like, okay, let me format my CV <laughs> to the questions they're listing. Right. So it's like, you have to almost sell it in that way. It's an interesting approach. It is that like, and that's, I think that's the, the difference. It's like, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know many people that are just like, Hey, I just want to like give you money because I just really <laughs> like you. It's like, no, yeah. like what, what, no, it just doesn't work like that. So. Yeah, it's, a lot of people have a misconception in the industry. It's like once I get signed, I've made it or whatever, but like they don't realize that it's a, or like they want to keep everything to themselves, but you have to realize that a label needs to make money. You know, everybody needs to sort of share in the pie to b everybody grow together, you know? So it's like you have to give as much as you get, I would say, you know? Yeah, it's so true. I mean, how do you navigate through that? Because, you know, there's something that Joe and I have talked about just with artists in general is, is there is a big sense of entitlement sort of in the community. I mean, how do you navigate through, you know, working with other creatives when maybe that's a pretty common uh, sort of vibe? Um, I mean, I just like always go back to, well, first for me, like I, I, I really try to stay as grounded as possible because I understand that like, things can go and move really quickly and things can also reverse and, you know, you be in a different space really quickly. And so um, I think it's a tricky one. Like you do meet a lot of artists that, you know, can be a bit entitled because maybe they are, you know, the 1% of artists that have the signing and are in a really great space. I think on the other side, it's just like, everyone right now is really trying to figure out how to get be, be seen more and how to make their music even more visible. And it's like, I don't know if there's been a trickier time in the music industry, even signed artists. Like I know I have a lot of friends that are with some of the major labels and, and for them too, like even they're having a hard time yeah. being seen because it's just, there's so much music being put out and you know, I have friends that have been shelved. They've, they've gotten the record deal of their dreams. They've finally signed with the labels they wanted to. They're in the U.S. They're living the L.A. dream or they thought. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I'm under this label. And they're not even putting out my music. So it's like, it's it's just tricky. Like, I just try to remember that even when you meet those artists that have, like, the big ego and you're like, oh, my goodness. Um, it's like, usually there's something else going on and everyone's kind of working toward the same thing. And it's just like that dream of being seen and having your music heard and getting to like the best place that you can, not just in regard to like a gazillion streams or a gazillion followers, but also just like being happy and it, with mental health being like a weird thing for a lot of people right now too. It's like even the most successful artists right now, like you can see some of them struggling. So I just try to have empathy for people. And then I stay away from people who just have weird energy. I think that's the other side of it though. Hashtag Instagram queen. Airbrush, crop that shit. Hashtag Instagram queen. Airbrush, hit the lead. Hashtag Instagram queen. Airbrush, crop that shit. Queen Dom Chapter One Queen. Um, let, let's talk about it. I mean, the, it's the first part of a double EP, the first installment. What sort of is the uh, the grand vision behind this one? Yeah, so Queen Dom is an EP about the complexities and the journey to just claiming your crown as a human. Um, I've been in so many spaces where people are just like, you just need to love yourself and you just need to be worthy. And, and you know, worthiness and self-love is the key. And people are like empowerment, empowerment. And I'm like, that's great. I love myself, but it's hard. Like, it, you don't just love yourself. Like, we're Easier said than done. <laughs> Yeah, like and and you like we do like naturally most people do love themselves, but it's like the process to like getting up every day and owning who you are and pushing through all the childhood stuff, all of the today stuff, all of the relationship stuff. It's a whole process, and so that's what Queen Dom is about. It's about kind of um, peeling back the layers. Um, I talk a lot about my my journey through, you know, growing up with religious parents and not really knowing how to be myself and 
um, how to, how to be comfortable with doing things that are authentic when they conflict with like what I've been taught as a kid to just like the process to being like, Hey, I'm going to just like show up and do me. And yeah. So I think it's kind of just peeling back all those layers as a human being, as a woman, as a black woman, um, you know, and, and yeah. So what was that like for you? I mean, did you find it very cathartic or was it a learning experience about yourself? Did you get to know yourself better? I think so. Um, in 2019, I hit a period um, where I was just like angry, <laughs> just hmm. angry about everything. I was like, I had my first serious breakup. Um, I had like a whole bunch of issues with my father that were coming to the surface because I've had a father that hasn't really consistently been in my life. And um and all of it just came crashing, you know, at the same time in which I was like, oh, shoot, like you, as an example, like you date and you hope to, you know, do better than the people that you grew up with. Or like, in my case, like I was like, okay, like my father is a bit of an issue and you want to stay away from anywhere close to that. But then you're like, oh, shoot, this person that I'm seeing is like a reflection of this person. And so, right. um, I think like it's the, what you try to avoid, it's like you attract. And so I feel like for me, it's just been one, a process of like forgiveness. Like I had to forgive myself for things like not having boundaries. Like I used to get so angry at people for overstepping or for asking for too much or for taking so much. But I think like as human beings, it's like, you realize it's like, Oh, it's not just people taking, it's us giving. And Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. ability to not know how to say no, as an example, like that, that for me came from growing up in a space where I was taught that you should always give a lot. And Mm -hmm. on the other side, I was really angry about the fact that I didn't know how to forgive my dad. And I was walking around and carrying that. And that was being reflected in my relationships and in so many things. So I think like Queen Dom chapter one is about forgiveness. It's about healing, but it's also about the frustration and wanting to heal and wanting to forgive when you've grown up in, you know, churches that have showed you how to do this your whole life. But for the first time, you really don't know where to start. Mm. There's no manual, wow. right? This is the right. No book to tell us what's to do this. It's like that. I find like, it's true what you said. Like, I find like today everything is just like, do these three things and you'll be happy or do this and you know, you'll have, you'll lose a hundred pounds or whatever it is. You know, everybody's looking for that easy way out, but they don't realize. I mean, look myself, I've had a good life. I've never really missed out on anything, but every day you have to show up and it's still work. You still have to, you know, try to improve everything. Right. So that's definitely uh, something that you know, I think a lot of people are, are struggling with these days. And I mean, a question for, for both of you, it's like, you know, I have my own journey every day that I have to go through in order to just show up, to walk into spaces, to be the confident person that everyone expects artists to be. But like, I'm curious with you too, like what your process is like, you know, you, you're running a podcast, you have so many other things going on in your life. And, um, you know, do you also go through that, those days where you're just like, I don't feel like showing up. And do you have like a process for, for showing up for yourself when you don't really, or don't feel like doing it? That's a good question. Go for it. You know what? I mean, I would say, I think it is unavoidable, you know, in, in any job, any career, but I think the, the thing you have to focus on is the passion, you know? So I would imagine with the songwriting, like you're thinking about that final product, you're thinking about that final track, you know, I'm thinking about helping artists. I'm thinking about getting people out there who deserve to have a platform. So, I mean, yeah, Joe, I don't know if you can relate, but I mean, I think it's stuff that everyone goes through at some point. Yeah. I mean, like, look, like, especially during the pandemic, my dream is to be working from home and now I'm like, I, I'm able to do it, you know, and, but there's still times when it's like, you, you know, when you realize you start the morning, you know, I have, I've shipped the kids off to school, all that stuff, taking care of all that. And then you're like, okay. Then you realize, oh, look at the mountain in front of me that I have to do, you know? So I, I kind of don't let that get to me because you know you can let that get to you so i kind of just like it's like that you know i know it's cheesy to say but it's like that 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 mountain you know you can move it one little shovel at a time you know so for me it's like just showing up being consistent mm-hmm. and you know because like you know same thing with the podcast we want the numbers to go up we're all focusing on the numbers and this and that so i stopped doing that because like i still i think that, that what we create has value is still good you know, even if let's say it's not, doesn't get a million views, you know, so it's like, I try not to let that psych me out basically, you know, so I just, I'm happy with simplicity, you know, in my, in my life. It's the first time a guest has asked us a question, know, which is a, which is a cool change of pace. So <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Like him and like 
maybe talking about your sort of overall artistry and, and your come up, I guess, what would you say took you from just sort of a like unknown artist completely to an artist who was getting interest from PR companies, management companies, like labels? What exactly was that transition or maybe elements of that transition for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I feel like this is not going to be the answer that you're going to It's <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> it's um, your answer. I, I just like don't wait around for anything or anyone to like create space for me. I think that's just it. Like I wasn't the artist in which people were like, oh my God, we just want to like sign her right away. Like I've had to work real hard. I've had to um, just like create a vision for myself and constantly walk into spaces where there is no clear path as to how that's going to happen and just to absolutely trust that it's going to. And so a lot of it for me has been a lot of faith. Um, it's been staying ready so that I don't have to get ready so that when, you know, opportunities present themselves, I'm just ready to go. Um, and then it's also been kindness <laughs> to be mm. quite honest. I'm the person that sends out cards to people, um, just to say, thank you for taking the time to have coffee with me. Um, I'm also the person that if you give me a microphone and you put me in a space and you say, go, I will show the hell up. And so <laughs> I, I think the, the combination of just staying ready, um, of being kind. And I think the last one is, is just growth. Um, I ensure that I set goals every year for myself personally, for professionally as an artist, so that the next time that someone sees me, I'm not in the same space. And so I think you know, a lot of the people that are opening doors for me now, like they've seen me for a really long time. I've been hustling and, you know, Will Smith has that quote that it's just like, you might, you might have more talent than me, but if we get on a treadmill, like I will outrun you mm -hmm. because it is about endurance and it's about constant growth. And so I just work really hard and I, um, I work really smart and I constantly ask myself what I need to change in order to get to the next stage that I want to be at. But the biggest thing for me is, and I talk to like a lot of people about it is I do deal with a lot of anxiety. Like it's been a hard journey for me and visualization has kind of been one of the tools that's really transformed my career. Like seeing myself on the stages that I want to be on before it happens. So that mm -hmm. when I get to that space, uh, the, the thing that's in our way, that's constantly blocking us from being great or, or, or having, you know, just those personal blocks. I've already worked through those in my, in my brain. And so visualization, right. meditation, faith, those have all been a couple of tools that have really helped me, you know, transform things. Hmm. That's awesome. Wow. When you when you said like set goals for yourself every year, is it something that you literally write down or is it something that just comes to you when you're in thought or meditation perhaps? And like, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm going to put more attention here or I'm going to do this. Or it's like, I'm just curious about the process. Yeah, I definitely write everything down. So okay. um, I'm a vision board person. Um, I, nice. I really have seen the impact of like when you write things down and you put them in front of you and you say them and you ask the universe for what you want. You know, there are going to be some people listening that are like, what does she mean by the universe? And I'm like, I'm talking about the universe. I, if you know, all you encompassing. Know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all encompassing, man. I mm -hmm. write down a list of the things that I want to achieve. I have a vision board that I look at every day. I speak things into existence and I, I no longer surprised when they happen. And I'm very intentional about saying like at the top of every, every year, like, what is it that you want to achieve this year? What did you do last year? What was and what wasn't working? And then I create a vision board um, on a daily basis. I wake up and I speak and say who I am. And that is like what type of artist it is. It's it's saying, you know, who I'm going to be opening for. It's saying the stages that I'm going to be on. And I am very intentional about that. And so, um, yeah, I just and then I go to the places that I need to be at and I'm like, OK, well, if there's no opportunity here, I'll make one. And that's kind of I just don't have the time to wait around for things. So you show up. See, that's what I think is key when you said intentional, because like a lot of people think, oh, let me just say I want to be at Madison Square Garden a hundred times a day and I'll get there. But no, there has to be a real internal intention. Like it's like you really need to want it, not just say it or think it or like it's something that's everybody wants kind of thing. I want to be a superstar or I want to be this, you know, so I find I've, I've done it twice in my life where I've seen the actual results where I've, I call it manifest destiny where I said I'm going to do this and or I'm going to only do this. And like it happened and it was like, OK. There's some truth in that, you know, like. No, 100%. Um, one other thing I wanted to know is just in terms of being a Toronto artist, um, I'm just curious what that means to you, if anything. I mean, is that something that you identify with or is it just coincidental? Absolutely. Like Toronto has been a huge part of my journey. Um, I think that Toronto opens you up to a lot of talent. Um, it also, there's a lot of support in the city, you know, like, I mean, 
Toronto is a tricky city in that a lot of artists had to leave in order and come back in order to make it. But it also is that we just have so many, so much support here. And so I definitely like, I represent Toronto. Um, I think and I, whenever I say Toronto, I'm like, Oh God, some people say Toronto and some people say Toronto. <laughs> I pronounce the T because I was like I Calgary and Calgary, you know, it's the same type of thing. <laughs> Do people say Calgary? Is that a thing? It's, people who are wrong say that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, so I 100% rep Toronto. I just, I also had like an interesting upbringing where I traveled a lot. And so I, I started out in Toronto, but lived in Uganda and Argentina. And I've just been around the world. And so I, oh. I kind of, yeah, I use the, the big city feel, uh, the big city like learnings to kind of bring me to other places in order to, you know, navigate. And then I also just have like a lot of support from everyone from funders to my fans here. So I will always be a Toronto girl. Hmm. It's, it's interesting. I started Sound Mojo where this uh, podcast lives for Watch Mojo. And, you know, I was talking to artists. Yeah, the goal of this whole Sound Mojo is to, you know, promote indie artists to Watch Mojo's huge audience uh, in, in their videos. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with metal guys. I've dealt with South, South African artists. I've dealt with a bunch of people, Russian. And a few of them, I remember my conversations were like, like in Albuquerque somewhere and he does like very chill hip hop kind of stuff. And he's like, Oh, my goal is to hit Toronto. My goal is to reach Toronto. Growing up, it was always like, mm-hmm. I want to get to LA. I want to get to LA. Right. And it's like, right. I was like, wow, we're there, man. Toronto is definitely wow. there now. It's like a place where people want to go to, you know, they say go where the actual music industry is. It, for me, it was such like a, wow, we're there. You know? I think that is interesting because there was a time when no one wanted to represent Toronto. Like, I don't know exactly. if we're back in the day, but like, Canada <laughs> or, wasn't cool. Being a, yeah, like, being you, a, you wouldn't say I'm from, I'm a Canadian artist. People would actually say, don't say I'm a Canadian artist, you know? Yeah. And, and like, I, I know like there are a lot of artists that are here where they are today, but I know rappers, I know singers, like they would not claim Canada. And it was, there's a, there's a point at which I think it was like, there are a lot of artists. Like I hate to just say it was like the Drakes and the Beavers and the weekends that helped to kick things off. They did play a huge role, but I think that there's just like so much talent coming out of Canada. Toronto has a lot of it, but you know, there are, there are the mm-hmm. Bramptons and the, the random parts of, of Ontario yeah. also and then outside that are also popping off. So, I mean, yeah, Scarborough, the whole deal. Yeah. Scott, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's it. speaking from my hometown montreal there's so much talent here too you know from and in every genre that's what i love about it you know there's every genre there's toronto or like montreal like there's something to be done in every genre it's not like where like certain cities are like uh, they just do this style you know whereas and it's funny because it's now that i think about it in real time it's like it's kind of just a reflection of a melting pot of, of different uh, people and, and upbringings. And now the music is the same as uh, diverse as the, as the people. Yeah. And I think that I was going to say, like, I'm in i uh, I'm in the UK right now and the great escape and a bunch of festivals are happening. And like Montreal is so dope. Like I, I think as a second place that I would live in Canada, I'd probably be Montreal just for the diversity, the sound. I know so many like French French singing and rapping artists that are so talented and then like bilingual to just, just the style and fashion. I think there's just like a whole vibe going on in, in a bunch of these mm-hmm. different places. So I huge shout out to Montreal and to all of my <laughs> artists from there too. <laughs> yes. Montreal insane community. So obviously here at Watch Mojo, uh, we're well known for our top 10 lists. So to wrap things up, we wanted to pull a list and just get your feedback and see if you could guess uh, the number one entry on this list. Um, oh. So this one here is the top 10 female R&B singers. And okay. before we have you guess who could be number one on, on our list, who would you say is number one on your list personally? Do you mean Canadian or? Anyway. It could be Canadian, but it could be any R&B. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so this is a tricky one because I feel like, and I know you're like, we just need an answer. Like, don't go into something No, no, we, we want to hear the process too. <laughs> the process for me is that a lot of artists uh, that are pop are classified as R&B just because they're Black and they're actually pop. And so <laughs> oftentimes with R&B lists, I'm always like, all right, like this is the way to be visible, you know? So I just preface this by like, I feel like I'm going to, uh, I, I will give an answer, but the back end of my answer is like that. I R and B and pop are so close to, together now that I, I always am just like I don't know, I don't know, but I will work within the parameters. <laughs> no, I hear you. It's like if Chris Brown puts out a song that's the same as Shawn Mendes, it's 
likely going to be R&B, right? Which is a strange sort of double standard. Yeah, Doja Cat. Like, Doja Cat is often in an R&B list. And I'm like, Doja Cat is She's a pop, pop. artist. <laughs> yeah, similar, like, to, similar to country, right? Like, it's pop. A lot of it is pop now, right? Yeah. Taylor it's, Swift, it's, it's, I, I don't see hear Taylor Swift as country. I hear her as pop. Right. So... Yeah. Anyhow, that's, that's <laughs> good point. That's a good point. We, we got we got to focus on that too. Um, but I mean, yeah, I don't know if you have a personal favor, but we do have our rankings. Okay, so I I have a couple of favorite artists right now that I live by. Um, Lizzo is literally like one day me and Lizzo will sit, will sit down and I will just hey, give her nice. hug. You know, yeah. Um, I I say Lizzo, Doja. Two, those are two at the top of my list. Um, right now i mean beyonce always beyonce is everything um i feel like yeah i think i think that those three are like my top and then tones and i like i just love tones and i she's so dope um i just scream her music in the shower like i don't sing it i just scream Scream it it. because (laughs) i feel like it just reaches my soul a little better (laughs) i love that i'm curious to hear your list i i really am excited okay well joe you want to go ahead well, I'm going to just the top three here. Uh, number three, I mean, no surprise, Mariah Carey. Okay, um, yeah. Number number two, Whitney, which is like for sure. And then the number one spot on this list was Aretha Franklin, which doesn't surprise me. Ooh. I, I know myself, if I wanted to be cool, I would have picked Etta James because I want to sound cool, you know. But uh, She was at uh, number 10. Yeah, I know, surprisingly, right? I didn't realize that y'all were like you. You were doing new classic artists, like I'm yeah, it was everybody, anybody. I just we're doing it. We're taking it way back, the way back machine. But this list is probably already. Yeah, I think so. Right? So man, but that's uh, a great. Yeah. And when you like, I think we forget too that like Aretha, Whitney, Mariah, they were like they they planted the seeds. Like, have you seen yeah. um, Aretha's documentary? Not with, yet. Is it good? Oh, with Jennifer Hudson. Oh my God, it's oh I, I went yeah, to another voice. Yet. It's it's just like their their stories are insane, but like I think that so many of us forget that like R and B, pop, gospel, rock, like they're they're all they're all they all come from the same yeah. the same space. Like this, right? Yeah. Don't don't quote me on this, but I remember hearing where like they made the R and B pop uh, chart because they didn't want black artists to be in the pop. I think mm-hmm. at a certain point, like there's there's something there, but I'm not, I, I remember hearing something like that. You know, I believe that like you can try to like. You could try to put a seed under a bucket and prevent it from seeing the sunshine, but eventually that's going to grow mm. and it'll push through and you can't do much. So no. where talent lives, talent will grow. Yep. Amen to that. I totally love that. Dominique, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I mean, is there anything else you want to add about sort of your tour or your music, anything that's coming up? Yeah. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, y'all can find me at Dominique Grant. It's D-O-M-A-N-I-Q-U-E-G-R-A-N-T. Um, Queen Dom chapter one is out in Queen Dom uh, chapter two, which is called Dom will be out in the fall. Look out for it. Uh, and just believe in yourself, have your own process and remember that you'll get where you need to be. So long as you put the right intention behind it, you trust yourself and you always operate from a space of kindness. That's awesome. Thank you so much and keep up the great work. Thank you so much for having me. Can you love me? Can you trust the way we I'm sorry. We want to give a huge shout out to Dominique Grant for taking the time to join us on episode 77 of Inner Sleeve. I got to say, Joe, (laughs) this was a great chat. You know, Dominique, she has so many different angles of this cover that I almost wonder how she has enough hours in a day. I guess uh, a team helps, a good team helps, a team uh, helps, you know, make all that stuff happen because like, yeah, yeah, me too. I, I got the impression it was in London when we were doing this, uh, we're in the UK, when we we're doing the, the interview. Uh, yeah, no, I know. You know, it's not surprising that she's like a theater kid, you know, like with all the 100%. stuff she's accomplished, right? Like it's not As a surprising. fellow theater kid, I could identify it too. I'm like, yes, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I really also enjoyed like her whole, um, uh, about applying for grants. You know, because we're lucky. We don't realize in Canada that we do, the government, you know, gives a lot of grants, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to work for them. You got to apply for them. And there's some people that are just, they, they're just, they know how to write the grant so that you're, you're going to get it. I've applied once way back in the past, didn't get accepted. But, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, like I didn't know, not, I just take for granted, you know, like I'm sure like in the UK or whatever, that they get, <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> that they get grants. Uh, exactly. But, uh, yeah, From know, Dominique like Grant. Yeah, oh, bam, a whole <laughs> bunch of puns over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're a comedy so show a, now. Yeah, exactly. That was a good insight. Uh, I like that. That um, Another thing I had here was like, yeah, just like being yourself, loving yourself, you know, like all the stuff she said with her dad and like family and stuff. So, you know, it wasn't easy, but look at her, man. She's like, uh, you know, what was she, you said RBC, women, top 25 women of influence in Canada, featured in Uganda's yeah. Pepsi World AIDS Day for an audience of over 40,000 plus people. So, Insane. I mean, TED Talk. I mean. Yeah. We could go on all day. So, I mean, it's insane. And, and, you know, like you're saying, Joe, not only just accepting yourself, you know, one side of yourself, but all aspects of yourself. And that's the mm. interesting thing about her, her latest EP is that she she's, you know, exploring maybe even sides of an alter ego, maybe if it, different sides of her personality that she's never really, you know, gotten out there. And she talked us through that process. So it was very interesting. And we definitely really appreciate her time. And we appreciate you guys checking in with us on episode 77 of Inner Sleeve. If you like what you saw on today's show, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. If you're a video viewer, we're also available on audio so you can catch us on the go. So make sure to go subscribe wherever you're tuned in. Make sure to check out our guests on her social media as well in the description below. And make sure to go follow us on social media at SoundMojo. Yeah. And uh, don't forget, like, you participate in the, the polls or, uh, you know, all the GIFs we're going to put, we put up. Uh, and let us know, like, in the comments, let us know, hey, get us this artist. Hey, uh, I want to see an interview with this. Uh, have you heard about this? Because, like, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and we do cover a lot of stuff, but we don't, you know, it's impossible to do everything, right? We would if we could, and we try yeah. to do it. So we, we appreciate we do, we do. you guys, 100%. Also, make sure to go check out our merchandise store. As we mentioned off the top, T-shirts, hoodies, sweaters, crewnecks, even phone cases. Answer your phone in style. I'm going to have to get one. My phone is nude at the moment. But make sure yeah. to go check <laughs> us out at the Sound Mojo merch shop in the description below. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Sound Mojo's Inner Sleeve. We'll catch you guys next week. <laughs>